Hi, everybody. Welcome to Euctropolis Live on a very sunny day in Nova Scotia, the hottest day of the year so far. Wow. <laughs> It's, um, I hope it's pleasant where you are. I hope it's warm. I hope you're warm. But I hope the forest is not on fire where you are. Send us some good vibes and send us some rain. As promised. Tone ukulele here today. And if you want to play along, um, grab your baritone and we will um, explore all things berry here today. There, there was a request last time uh, that one of these Euctropolis live sessions should be about the baritone ukulele. And so I thought that was a great idea. I love the baritone and I've been playing baritone for years. In fact, when I think back on it, there was a baritone track on my very first album that came out ugh, over 20 years ago, 21 years ago. And uh, that had a baritone track on it, uh, the Meditation um, from Thais by Massenet, which was a piece that I had played as a kid on the violin. And I've always loved the melody and, and I love the mellowness of, uh, of the, um, the baritone on that track. I played it kind of finger style and um, I don't even think you can get that album anymore. It's out of print. I have a couple copies kicking around here. So anyway, the point is I've been really into the baritone for a really long time. Just last year or so, um, we finally got a baritone course on Eutropolis. It's baritone ukulele jazz. That's been really popular. And uh, so today what we're gonna do is just uh, look at some of the common questions uh, around baritone and some of the common misconceptions and some of the main challenges that we face as baritone ukulele players and lovers of that baritone sound. So um, let's get right to it. Uh, I guess <clears throat> the first question is like, why play baritone? You sometimes get this question from ukulele players who are like, well, if I wanted that sound, I would just play the guitar. So why would I play the baritone ukulele? Well, I don't know. I mean, when it comes down to it, when you spend your whole life in that soprano concert tenor world of sound, and then after years of, of just existing in that world, then you go to this sound and it seems kind of exotic. Um, it seems so mellow. And so I think that mellow sound is one reason that ukulele players are drawn at some point in their ukulele journey. They're just drawn to the baritone and the mellowness of the sound. Then again, um, it's also a very biting sound when you want it to be. It can really, it has a kind of a bark to it, a bit of a bite. Just sort of picture Django Reinhardt and and Stefan Grappelli and the Hot Club de Paris. You know the that I don't know that range. There's a certain bite to the tone. I don't know. At some point, you just want to add that to your bag of tricks and. Uh, um, so number one, the tone, both the mellowness and the, the fact that it can bite when you need it to bite uh, and really uh, cut through the mix when you need it to cut through 
that's one of the great things about baritone. Here's something even more persuasive, I think, uh, 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 when it comes to, you know, why should I try the baritone if I've never tried it before? Most of us who play ukulele love to sing. It's one of the reasons we're attracted to the instrument is because uh, we can sing and play at the same time, unlike a recorder, which my son is learning right now. And he's actually really enjoying it, but um, he cannot sing and play at the same time. And of course, on the ukulele, we can do just that. And we do it all the time. But oftentimes, um, it's hard to find the exact right key for your voice. And so uh, let me do a little demonstration here. If you have a baritone ukulele handy, as well as your conventional uh, GCEA tuning, here's my prediction. You will always be able to find the right key for your voice and the right shapes for your hand. This is how we have our cake and eat it too. If you only have one ukulele, if you only have a soprano concert or tenor, that standard tuning, either the voice or your hand is going to have to compromise. You know, you'll, you'll either be in a key that doesn't feel great for your voice, but it feels really good ergonomically for your fingers, or the opposite. You'll be in a key that uh, feels really good for your voice, but your fingers have got to sort of do backflips to get into their places. Well, enter the baritone, and it kind of solves that problem. So uh, let's say I've got this uh, tune, uh, Jada, that I've been kind of jamming around on here. Mm, that, oh, how's it go? Mm, jada, there it is. Jada, already kind of high for my voice. Jada, jada. That's a funny little bit of melody. It's so soothing and appealing to me. It goes cha da, cha da, cha da, cha da, jing, jing, jing. Okay, I have to sing it there because that's where I feel most comfortable playing the chords. I really like playing this in F. It feels great. All these chord shapes are very familiar to me and they feel good under my fingers. Um, but I do find that it's a little high for my voice. I don't know if you guys felt that, but it feels to me like it's a bit high. It's sort of ja -da, ja -da. I kind of have to go for those notes. I can't sing this in a really mellow way, the way I might want to sing it to, you know, um, I don't know, around a campfire or at a kind of capilla. I kind of have to sing it as if I'm playing at a, an old uh, music hall, you know, vaudeville. Um, I'd like to sing it a little more mellow, but because of the high range, I can't. But then I grab my baritone and I play exactly the same fingerings, the fingerings that I already know and love. And now all of a sudden, magically, jada, 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 jing, jing, jing. Jada, jada, jing, jing, jing. You see where it's put me in my vocal range? I'm down uh, a jump from where I was. That's a funny little bit of melody. It's so soothing and appealing to me. It goes jada, jada. Now I'm in that mellow zone that I couldn't get to before. And yet my fingers are happy because they are playing 
the standard chords that I know and love. I'm not in the key of F anymore, but you know what? I don't really care what key I'm in as long as it feels good and it sounds good. So that is the second reason why um, picking up a baritone will make your life better because you'll always find the right key for your voice and you'll always find the right key for your fingers and you can have your cake and eat it too. How many times in your life does that happen where you can have it all? <laughs> you know, this is one of those times. Plus, I, I think I just want to add one thing to that on a, on a musical and, and creative side of things. Now that I'm a little lower in my range, ja -da, ja -da, ja -da, ja -da, jing, jing, jing. all of a sudden I have melodic headroom that I didn't have before, and I can explore new phrasings that were just not an option for me before because I was already hitting the ceiling of my vocal range. So I might go, ja -da, oh, ja -da. I, th there's no way I could have hit that. Oh, ja -da, ja -da, ja -da, ding, ding, ding. I might be more tempted to stay up because I'm more comfortable there. Ja -da, oh, ja -da. I wouldn't have sung it that way because I would have been a little timid about hitting those higher notes. That's a funny little bit of melody. It's so soothing and appealing to me. It goes ja da, oh ja da, ja da, ja da, ding, ding, ding. All of a sudden, not only is it <clears throat> comfortable because I'm in a lower range, comfort is one thing, but creativity is another. It opens new uh, possibilities in that higher melodic range that were just, at least I felt, were just closed to me previously. So these are all reasons why having a tenor and a baritone is just like the, the left hand and the right hand of your ukulele adventure. And if it doesn't work on one, flip to the other because you'll probably find the right fit in that other tuning. And the third and final reason, just to get things started here, you know, why baritone? <laughs> um, the third and final reason that I wanna highlight at least is that if you play in an ensemble, this tone, this tone fills out the sound of the ensemble and it, it it's sort of the meat in the sandwich. Um, if you just have standard tuned ukuleles and a bass, which is very common, um, a U bass or an upright bass or an electric bass, this standard tuned ukulele combined with a bass is a really nice combination. But when you think about it, it is kind of a bread sandwich, right? Like those instruments are pretty far apart and there's nothing in between. And that is why if you look at the, uh, the orchestra, the symphony orchestra or the string orchestra, that's why violas were invented. Violas fill the gap between the violins and the cellos so that you don't just have a bread sandwich. So you have something right in the middle that fills the gap. And the baritone does that in an ensemble or a jam session. It sits in between that standard tuning ukulele and the bass, whoever's playing the bass. Okay, so it fills that gap and it really completes the sound of any ukulele jam session or ukulele ensemble. So I know not everybody is playing in an ukulele band or an ensemble, but um, that's something to consider. Uh, it really makes the sound more full and uh, rich. So there you go. Three reasons why uh, baritone is beautiful. Uh, first of all, the sound, the mellowness, but also that biting character when you need it. Second, having your cake and eating it too. You can find the key that's right for your voice and at the same time, the shapes that are right for your hand. And finally, it fills in the sound of any ensemble and uh, bridges the gap between standard tuning and the bass range. So there you have it. That's my case, right, for baritone. Um, it's not that I 
think that I need to persuade you. I think a lot of us have this natural inclination to explore new instruments and hey, who doesn't want to save up and buy a new ukulele anyway? So this is a good excuse. Uh, but anyway, those are my personal three reasons why the baritone is so appealing. It's so soothing and appealing to me. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so the other thing I thought we might discuss is like, I thought we might do a, a lightning round of baritone questions, some myths, some misconceptions, uh, just to get started. And before we get into student questions, let's try a sort of a, a little lightning round uh, so that we're all sort of on the same page here. Number one in the lightning round of baritone ukulele questions. If I pick up a baritone ukulele, am I going to be able to play it? <laughs> or do I have to relearn all my chords? Uh, the good news is you do not have to relearn all your chords. All the chords and the muscle memory and the scales and the melodies that you know on your standard tuned ukulele will work on the baritone. Period. Full stop. You're good. It's not like going and learning a mandolin, which has a completely different tuning, or a tenor guitar, which has a completely different tuning. This is this is the these are the same cookie cutters that you're used to on your ukulele. You can use those same shapes, scales, patterns. It all translates to the baritone ukulele. The one footnote to that is that everything will change its name. <laughs> okay, that that's the one footnote. I know that's kind of a big footnote, but still, it will sound good. You can pick it up. You won't necessarily know what chord you're playing, but it will sound good. Okay. Um, it, now we can we can look at ways of uh, making the jump and knowing what you're playing, which we are going to do in a minute. But the point is, um, you can do it. It will translate, but the names change. I just want to say, the names like major chords don't turn into minor chords. Uh, diminished chords suddenly don't turn into augmented chords. All that changes is the letter name. And we'll look more at that in just uh, a minute or two. Uh, second question in the lightning round. Uh, these are questions that I've gotten many, many times over the years. Second one is, what strings do I use on a baritone? Um, can I use all nylon strings or all metal strings or what is it? I would say most baritone players use a combination of metal and nylon. Um, I use three nylon strings and one metal string. I don't think you're going to get a set of baritone ukulele strings that are all metal or all nylon. I don't think, I, I could be wrong here. I'm not a string expert, I have to admit, but uh, I don't think that exists. All metal or all nylon, at least it would be a custom order. So baritone has this nice blend of the, the shiny metallic sound and the more mellow nylon sound. That's just kind of the way it is. Um, is the baritone uke in the same range as a guitar with the same chord shapes and names? Ah, so if you're a guitar player, can you make the jump to baritone relatively painlessly? Yes, this is where it really shines. If you have a friend who already plays guitar, and, and they want to be involved in your jam session, but they're like, oh, I don't want to relearn all my chords. Give them a baritone. Because all the stuff they know on guitar works out beautifully on the baritone and doesn't even change name. It's literally a guitar minus the two bass strings. So. Yes, if you're coming from the guitar, it is a perfect seamless transition, just so you know. And on that note, is the baritone ukulele related to the tenor guitar? They look very similar. And sometimes in antique stores or instrument stores, you can easily mistake a, a baritone ukulele for a tenor guitar. Tenor guitar being the four string guitar uh, that is really the same size as the baritone ukulele. It's, it's hard to tell them apart at first. The, the two things that um, 
give it away are that tenor guitars have a much thinner neck. The, uh, the, the frets are narrower and the neck itself is just thinner. And uh, also the tenor guitar usually has all metal strings and it's tuned in fifths. They are very much sort of, they, they very much sort of step on each other's toes in terms of the musical instrument uh, I don't know, the zoo of musical instruments, <laughs> you know, like they, they're sort of like stepping on each other's toes in the same cage. They're, they're, they're closely related, but they really are distinct. And those are a couple of ways of telling them apart. Um, again, the tenor guitar, you would have to relearn all your chords. It's actually more like a mandolin in its tuning. So there you have it. You got ukulele, guitar, uh, ukulele, guitar and baritone ukulele are all in the same family. And you've got mandolin, fiddle, and tenor guitar are in their family uh, in terms of the tuning and the shapes that they would use on the fretboard. Um, okay, let's do one more and then we'll get into some student questions. Is the fifth fret of the baritone really the same as the open strings of the soprano ukulele? Is the fifth fret actually like the open strings of the soprano. Yes, that's exactly the same notes. My dog has fleas. So if you're playing baritone and you feel kind of lost and far from home, just put your first finger straight across on the fifth fret of the baritone and you'll feel right at home again. My dog has fleas. You actually haven't gone that far from home. Uh, if, if this is home, it's still there. It's right under your nose. You haven't gone too far. You haven't strayed from that place uh, that you know and love very far at all. And this goes the other way. For baritone ukulele players, if you're in a workshop uh, with soprano, concert, and tenor ukes, um, put a capo on the fifth fret and you will be able to follow along with that class and do the same moves, the same shapes and patterns. Um, having a capo as a baritone player is extremely important. <laughs> you should always have a capo in your case because sometimes as a baritone player, you're gonna wanna do the fifth fret trick. Uh, there'll be something new that you're learning, some skill, some song that's really based on the physicality of the fretting hand, and you're just gonna wanna learn it the way that everyone else is learning it with the capo on the fifth fret. And then when you go home, you can take the capo off and play it all down in the first few frets of the baritone neck once you've learned the moves, right? So it's an essential piece of equipment for, I would say all ukulele players, but especially baritone ukulele players, get a capo, leave one in your case, leave one in the glove box of your car, you know, leave one uh, by the front door, put one in your wallet. So you always have a capo, no matter what. Don't put one in your wallet, that's a bad idea. Okay. Uh, one question in the chat here is uh, um, from Angela. She says, what about the guitar lele? Uh, where does that fit in? That's a good question uh, in terms of those families I was talking about. The guitar lele, uh, which is a si six string short scale guitar, that fits in with the um, baritone ukulele, standard ukulele, and guitar. The tuning system is the same. So it, it fits in with those instruments and anybody can move around between those instruments fairly easily. Uh, the other family is the mandolin, fiddle, and um, what's the other one? Tenor guitar. Those have a different tuning system. They're tuned in fifths, and so it changes the shapes of all the um, patterns that we that we use. Yes. Okay. Now here's an interesting question that um, that came in from uh, McKaylin, and I'm just going to paraphrase um, McKaylin's question here, <laughs> and then we'll get into the the question itself. Uh, the question that I get from a lot of people about baritone is, are my hands going to be too small? Like, am I just going to find it's too big for me? I remember as a kid moving from 
a concert size ukulele to a tenor size ukulele. And I remember that being a stretch. And for the first few weeks, you know, missing chords and missing shifts because I don't know, I just wasn't used to it. It was like, um, you know, all of a sudden um, having a growth spurt and, you know, going to turn on the tap in the morning and sort of missing because you're not used to the proportions anymore. Is that going to happen to me when I go to the baritone ukulele? Are my hands too small? That is a good question. Uh, so let's dig into that. Um, Michaelin says specifically, she says, I'm trying to figure out which fingers go where for each chord and the C diminished seven is really hard for my small hands. Uh, she says, uh, viewing your video demo, I don't quite see how you do that chord. It's kind of a quick transition to that chord. Is there a simpler substitute for that? She says, help. <laughs> now this is kind of a baritone question. And it's also kind of a general ukulele question. And that's why I like this question so much, because if you're tuning in here and you're like, I don't know if I can handle all this baritone talk. Uh, well, this question applies across the board because uh, a diminished seven chord is a handful, no matter what size of ukulele you are playing. So let's look at that for a second because there's something to be learned here uh, for any ukulele player. Uh, either who's struggling with diminished seven chord shapes or who has a student who's struggling with diminished seven chord shapes. Uh, there's something to be learned here. So uh, I said, uh, way to go. Good, good, for, good on you for jumping into all of this. Um, you just have to be bold and get started with these chords. Uh, bravo. I said, you're right. The C diminished seven is a challenge. Um, and I said, here are a couple of alternatives and ideas for you to literally get a handle on this chord. Um, okay, so the first thing is you can leave out the first string or the fourth string. This is a, a really important thing that I find is often sort of glossed over in our ukulele conversations. If you take a C diminished seven, which uh, if you know, if you play along with me, the frets from the ceiling down to the floor would be one, two, <laughs> one, two. That's one, two, one, two. And I'm playing on the baritone now, so one, two, one, two. Now that is the chord that sort of says to uh, the listener, you know, something is about to happen. It's a chord that's just full of expectation and tension. It demands to be resolved. But it itself is one of the most interesting creatures that we have in the, in the, the musical landscape. And the reason it's so interesting, if you're really interested in music theory, is that it's the it's one of the only chords that is perfectly symmetrical. And what I mean by that is every note in the chord is the same distance from every other note. So it's a minor third to a minor third, a minor third, and a minor third. And it just goes on in minor thirds. And it stacks these minor thirds on top of each other. And it just repeats and repeats and repeats. And that makes it kind of a headless monster <laughs> because you can't actually tell in the new finish chord which note is the root because all the notes are just equidistant from one another. There's no hint as to which one of these is the root. I mean, where should I stop? Which one should I call the root? Eh, you know, at a certain point, you just pick one and say, well, I'm gonna name it after this note. But I could name it after any of the notes because it is this headless chord um, with equal distances between each one of its parts. So right away, it's kind of a not completely unique because there are a few other chords that have this quality, but not many. It's a, it's a pretty um, distinct sound 
and it's a distinct beast when it comes to uh, music. So that's one thing to realize. And that's, that's the reason why once you master this chord shape, all the other diminished seven chords look the same. Because as you take a block from the bottom and you put it on top, take a block from the bottom and you put it on top. When you take a note from the bottom and you put it on top, well, what, what happens? Nothing. <laughs> it doesn't change the shape of that chord because all of the notes are the same distance apart. When you take one from the bottom and you put it on top, that's an inversion. But in this case, it doesn't change the physical hand shape. All the voicings of this chord or all the inversions of this chord are the same on the fretboard. It's pretty cool. Uh, it's, a, it's an expensive initial purchase, <laughs> but once you get it, it's a great deal. You get four for the price of one. Totally worth the investment. But to go back to the hack that we're talking about here is you get the most important notes of the chord um, just by playing three of the strings. You can try this shove. Play the second, third, and fourth strings only. You still get that sense of tension. Play the first, second, and third strings. You still get that sense of harmonic tension. And if I play this in context, you can get away with just playing three out of the four strings, especially if you play the second, third, and fourth strings. This is a hack that doesn't get talked about very often, but the second and third and fourth strings only in a diminished seven chord on the ukulele, just those three strings, second, third, and fourth, just those three strings spell out a diminished triad. Now, it's not the full diminished seven chord, but it's the meat and potatoes of the chord. Um, you can also use the first, second, and third strings, but in some cases, you won't get quite as much, I don't know, um, garlic in the sound. You won't get quite as much flavor. If you need a hack for a diminished seven chord, just play the second, third, and fourth strings. That frees up your little pinky finger. It doesn't have to be involved. And it's no more difficult than playing a G shape on a standard ukulele or a D shape on the, on the baritone. This is a shape of the fingers that we're quite familiar with, most of us. Um, and, and so this makes the diminished seven at least an entry into it, a lot more manageable. So consider that if you're having trouble um, with a diminished seven chord on any size of ukulele, but especially if you're on the baritone, it's not as bad as it looks, especially if you focus on the second, third, and fourth strings. And eventually you'll be so comfortable with that that you'll be able to add the pinky finger back in. And remember, don't do what I just did. <laughs> I accidentally played all four strings. It will be dissonant. So make sure that as you strum through, I like to strum this with my thumb, and I make sure that my thumb comes to rest on the first string. That way I'm sure I don't pluck it by accident. And that gives you a diminished triad. Okay, the the only other thing I could uh, recommend for Michaelin was that, um, you know, if it's the pinky finger, the little finger, that's the problem, as it is for so many of us, that pinky finger is just kind of underdeveloped and underused and underpaid. Uh, if that's the issue, you might want to bar, you know, bar one fret and then just use the middle and ring fingers to uh, play the other two notes. So one, two, one, two. I bar the first fret and add the middle and ring fingers to get the other notes. That doesn't work for everybody because not everybody loves to bar the, uh, the the strings. But if you're uh, if you're uh, comfortable with the bar, then that's another way of playing the diminished seven chord. So the answer is 
your hands probably are not too small for the baritone. <laughs> to come all the way back to the initial questions, uh, to the initial question, your hands are probably just the right size. You may have to find uh, a workaround or two to, um, to uh, get your fingers um, wrapped around some of the more challenging chords, but there is always a workaround. And um, it's, um, it's your job to find it. And if you can't find one, ask the question, just like Michaelin. And I'm sure uh, the community uh, on Utropolis or me uh, will chime in with some ideas about how to do it. You can find your way to a baritone um, no matter what. And that just proves it. So thanks, Michaelin, for the question. And I uh, hope that helps. Okay, here's another one. Um, this one comes from, oh no, uh, we're gonna get to a question from Sue in just a minute. But before we get to that question from Sue, um, here's another question that I have had so many times about the baritone ukulele. I'm just gonna paraphrase it because so many people have asked this question. And the question is, how do you transpose between standard ukulele tuning and the baritone tuning. In other words, if I play what looks like a C chord from my tenor ukulele, if I play that what looks like a C chord on a baritone, what chord is that? And how do I quickly bridge between one tuning and the other in my brain? Is there a strategy for figuring this out? Okay. This is one of the things that keeps people from exploring baritone because they think, well, okay, I can play, but I don't know what I'm playing. And I have a hard time reading the sheet music because, you know, if it says a C chord, I have to play what looks like an F chord. Ah, forget it. <laughs> right? It's a lot like learning a new language. Um, when we first start learning a new language, of course, you're going to be translating in your mind between your mother tongue and the new language. Of course, that's gonna happen. It's not until you start dreaming in your new language and telling jokes in the new language that you know that you're fluent. <laughs> I think those are the two best tests. Are you dreaming? You know, for me, it was learning French. Are you dreaming in French? Are you telling jokes in French? And when you're counting numbers, like doing math or like adding up the bill and figuring out the tip, are you doing that in French? <laughs> or, or are you flipping back into English? You know, those are the kind of tests for, are, are you really there yet? I can't say that I really made it there with French, but um, I try. <laughs> if you've ever tried to learn a new language, I'm sure you can relate. And coming from tenor or concert or soprano ukulele to baritone is very similar. For a long time, you will be translating in your head. You'll be transposing in your head. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just a natural step in the process of, of learning a new instrument. So let me give you one tip that I'm hoping can help to make that transition a little easier. As you know, if you put your first fret, uh, if you put your first finger on the fifth fret, you get your standard ukulele tuning. My dog has fleas. And so what is the difference between this tuning, standard ukulele tuning, and baritone tuning? What is that distance? Well, it turns out, in musical terms, uh, we call that distance a fourth. So we're going down, we're getting lower in the scale, by a fourth. So G, C, E, A. Let's, let's look at the note A, uh, the first string in my tenor ukulele world. What does that note become, that first string on the baritone? Well, it goes down a fourth. So it goes down four steps. A, count backwards with me through the alphabet. Uh, a, G, uh, F, and uh, E. E, that's right. So it's four steps down from where I started. Does anyone else feel that it's really difficult to count backwards through the alphabet? 
or is it just me? I I don't know. I guess they don't really teach you this in school, right? I mean, they teach you how to count 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Happy New Year. I mean, counting down from 10, that's a life skill. Everybody learns how to do that. Uh, you know, three, two, one, blast off. You know, this is the stuff that kids learn. You have to learn how to count down in reverse through numbers. But I don't think there's as many instances in our lives where we have to count backwards through the alphabet. You know, you just don't, it's not, it's not like D, C, B, A, happy new year. <laughs> Nobody... Nobody does that. We only ever learn to go A, B, C, D, E, F, G. I, I think it's a life skill to count backwards through the alphabet, but I'm biased because I'm a musician. For musicians, it's very important to be able to count backwards through the alphabet. So uh, if we take the next string, uh, what is it? Um, G, C, E. Normally that second string is an E. Now if we go down four, try it with me. Uh, E, uh, D, C, B. Yes, and I get the open B string of the baritone. I have to count backwards four steps in the alphabet. You know, guys, I'm not sure I'm going to get quick enough at this, <laughs> this counting backwards thing. You know, by the time I've counted backwards four steps, which I know is the real answer, by the time I've done that, you know, the whole jam session has already moved on by three or four chords. It's not quick enough. I don't think I'm going to get there. So if you have to do the long division to make the transposition between standard tuning and baritone tuning, don't count down. Count up. Don't count down by four. Count up by five. I know it's a bit of a hack because the sound literally does go down, right? So technically, yeah, okay, we should be counting down. But counting down four, turns out you'll get the same answer as if you count up five. That's the way the musical scale works, right? Think about it. If you've got one through eight, if I was to start on uh, sort of halfway up there, I could go down. Da, 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 and I'd get to the home note of the scale. I could count down four. One, two, three, four. Or I could count up five. One, two, three, four, five. And I get to the same destination, at least in terms of the letter name. So counting down by four in music, I'll get the same letter name as if I count up by five. And you know what? I'm pretty good with the number five. Because if I put it, um, if I start on my thumb, I'll just end up at my pinky, and I get to count up through the alphabet instead of down through the alphabet. So let's do that very first question we did again. If I'm on A and I want to transpose to baritone tuning, well, instead of counting down four, let's count up five. Pretend A is on your thumb and just say A, B, C, D, E. <laughs> Now that I can do much more easily, A, B, C, D, E. I practiced that my whole life. It's very quick, it's very intuitive. If I count up five, starting on my thumb and ending on my pinky, A, B, C, D, E, I get that answer much more quickly than if I had to count down four. Let's try it on the note E, because that was our second question. If I count up five, E, F, G, A, B. I get there much more quickly in my brain, and this translation, which one day, hopefully I'll grow out of and I won't need these training wheels. But in the meantime, counting up by five is a lot quicker than counting down by four. And this works not just for notes as we're doing here, but it works for chords as well. So let's say I play a C chord on the soprano ukulele, and then I take that very same chord shape and I plunk it down on the baritone. What chord am I playing now? That's the question. What chord am I playing if I make it look like I'm playing a C chord on the baritone. I count up five, C, D, E, F, G, boom. That's the answer. I'm now playing a G chord. It's that simple, okay? Now, some of you already know that one. So you're like, well, what's the big deal? Why, why would I do, why would I go to all that trouble if I already know that 
Uh, that's a G on the baritone. Well, there's going to be chords that you don't know yet. Um, if I play a B7 on my ukulele, uh, and I want to figure out what that's going to be on the uh, on the baritone, actually, that's not a good example. If I, <laughs> I'll tell you why in a second. If I play, uh, let's see, um, if I play uh, an F chord on my ukulele, one of my favorite chords of all time. If I play an F chord on my ukulele and I plunk that down onto the baritone, what chord do I get? Well, count with me. Five up. F, G, A, B, C. Now I'm playing a C chord. That's a quick, handy dandy way of figuring out the translation or the transposition between what you're used to and where you are now on the baritone. Okay, the reason I reneged on the B uh, example is because if I go up five from B, uh, this is off the record, uh, B, C, D, E, F, it turns out it's an F sharp, and there's no way to know that except to know that. It's one of those weird things that we decided a long time ago about the way we were going to lay out the scale. So actually, five up from B is F sharp. A good one, a little exception to throw in your bag of tricks, but that's why I reneged on that because I knew it would be a bit confusing. But anyway, the point is count up five, don't count down four, and you will have a brand new sort of compass for navigating the baritone ukulele fretboard as you make that transition and as you work toward fluency with a new tuning. Of course, eventually you won't have to do this. But this is a bridge to a new place, and I hope you'll um, make the most of it. All righty. Now, where are we at? Sayara is here, um, and I'm just going to check if she's uh, highlighted any questions that are coming in the chat. I've got my eye on the chat, too. Um, don't be afraid to... Um, to drop any uh, any questions that you might have in the chat here. Uh, I just want to say, by the way, while we're just paused for a, a station break here, um, last month or maybe six weeks ago, actually, I can't remember when, not too long ago, I was in Toronto um, for Melanie Doan's Uke Day which was an amazing event for 450 kids crammed into a gym in Toronto, singing and playing together. The entire gym was filled with ukuleles and singing uh, and basses and drums. And it's the product of the youth school program that she's got going in Toronto. Melanie Doan is daughter of Chalmers Doan, who's my co-author on uh, the ukulele in the classroom books and also the godfather of Canadian ukulele. And so Melanie uh, grew up playing ukulele and um, she grew up in, in the, the most famous ukulele program, really the school ukulele program, I would say in the world. And she's taken a lot of that and fashioned her own program in Toronto. And it's really incredible what they're doing over there with hundreds and hundreds of students every week. And they just put out a video that if you have not seen this, it's well worth your time. Um, I don't have the link right at my fingertips, but uh, Sayara, if you have the link to their new single, Ooh Child, um, it is really something special. Um, you should really check this out. I'm going to drop the link in the uh, in the chat. It's featuring Molly Johnson, who's just a wonderful jazz singer, and brings a lot of a lot of uh, feeling to the piece. And uh, the video that goes along with it. If you want to feel inspired, if you're feeling a little bit down, like uh, if there are wildfires in your backyard, and you're and you're worried about the future of AI in the world. <laughs> <laughs> then just watch this video. You'll feel better. It, it's inspiring. It gives you hope. Um, it shows kids doing good stuff and uh, Melanie and her teachers leading a program that just, um, it just uh, makes you feel good about where things are going. 
boy, there's so much news that uh, makes you feel like, hmm, uh, you know, makes you feel like you need something to inspire you. And uh, this could be it. So check it out. You won't regret it. It's really amazing. I wanted to make sure to give them a shout out because I'm really impressed and amazed and uh, just sort of transported by this, uh, by this single that they just put out. So check it out and um, leave a comment, give them a thumbs up, let them know that, you, uh, that you're supporting what, uh, what they're doing. And thanks Melanie for the, the inspiration. All right, let's see. Um, I've got one more baritone question that I wanna to get to. Um, there's a question in the chat here. <laughs> uh, Andre says, um, okay, maybe James doesn't need a looper, but what is your recommendation from a mobile loop station? Um, any experiences or ideas? <laughs> That's funny. I, uh, I, well, you know, I've made a bit of a statement about, you know, not needing a, a looper, but trying to do all the parts simultaneously. But still, I mean, there are times when you just need to have a looper. Um, I was just looking at the, the new Roland RC, uh, I can't remember what it's called, 808. It's like a, it's, it's like a big, it's actually not that big, a red um, pedal board with like three silver metal switches. It really looks amazing. If I wanted to invest in a loop station, that is what I would invest in right now. It's the, uh, it's the most recent guitar looper by Roland. They really are the, the top and that new one looks amazing. So I would say, check it out. It's not the Boss RC1. Uh, what is it? Oh my goodness. Oh. Let's see if can... Here it is. It's the RC 600. Woo. That's the newest one. And I really think that one is pretty awesome. The RC 300 is one that I actually did have and, and tried out, but it was so bulky. I couldn't travel with it. Uh, the RC 600 has like all of that stuff, but um, um, it's much more portable. Still, you know, not a thing you're going to put in your back pocket, but pretty amazing. Okay. Let's uh, finish off with one more question here. Before we, um, before we wrap it up, I want to also address one sort of controversy in uh, in baritone land. And this is something that uh, I seriously want you guys to think about um, because I do not know the answer to this. This is sort of an open question for the ukulele community. And I would love to know, you know, what you think about this question. And that is what to do um, with the D string. Um, the D string on the baritone is that string closest to your face as you're playing. It's the fourth string. Um, people like me like to tune it high. My dog has fleas. So that's a re-entrant baritone tuning. Other people uh, prefer to have the low D tuning. I can't even sing that low. My dog has fleas. <laughs> and um, that is really rich and nice. I see why people like the low D tuning. For the same reason people like low G tuning on the on the tenor or the, the concert. Um, but I find that most of the time when I'm playing baritone, I'm playing um, jazz or, or sort of folkier stuff. And I find that the high D gives me a nice, um, a nice 
tight voicing that I really like. I think it's pretty. And um, there have been a few, not many, but a few really key players over the years who have also um, favored this high D baritone tuning. I really took a cue from Lyle Ritz. Uh, I love his playing. I was always really inspired by Lyle. And he used this re-entrant uh, baritone tuning, which I've become very fond of as well. Uh, Benny Chong uses this tuning. Um, Byron Yus Yusui has used this tuning. So maybe not the majority of people, but some really heavy hitters in, in the ukulele world gravitate toward this high D tuning. That part is not the controversial part of the tuning discussion. The controversial part of the tuning discussion, because whether you use high D or low D, that's just kind of personal preference. And yeah, I say save up and buy two baritones so that you have one in each. You know, that's what I always say to people uh, when they're debating high G or low G. I say, eh, you know, it's it's the left hand and the right hand. You need both. Why choose? Um, the more debatable part is the fact that D is the lowest note at all. Here's what I mean. When I was arranging um, a whole series of uh, classical pieces for ukulele ensemble, uh, and this hasn't come out yet. Those of you who've been following me for a while and studying with me, you know that I've been sort of teasing this classical ukulele collection for years. And <laughs> I actually cannot say why I haven't put it out yet. Um, I don't know, maybe, maybe there are a few edits there that I just couldn't get around to making. And I actually don't really know why I haven't put it out. Actually, come to think of it, maybe it's this exact question that I'm stumbling around right now that's kept me from putting it out. So let's solve this. Let's solve this question. Here's the question. When you have an orchestra of ukuleles and, and really think like an orchestra with like violins, uh, violas, cellos, basses, but instead of those sections, you would have soprano ukulele, uh, concert ukulele, tenor ukulele, probably with the high, with the low G, uh, and then baritone ukulele. You might even have you bass, like bass ukulele as well. So you literally have them fanned out in that sort of familiar symphonic format. Okay, so you've got your sopranos, your concerts, your tenors, and your baritones. And now you start to arrange for that ensemble. And they're tuned in standard tuning, like GCEA. And so what keys do they want to play in? Well, they probably want to play in C quite a bit, you know? Uh, an F and uh, some of the more sort of ergonomic keys for the uh, for the standard tuned ukulele, but C really is sort of like the the jewel in the crown, isn't it? I mean, we all gravitate to C at a certain point. Uh, for re-entrant tuned ukuleles, that's the lowest note on the ukulele, and so C ends up being the sort of focal point. It sort of has a kind of gravitation to it, and you keep coming back to the key of C when you're arranging pieces for a large ensemble like that. Here's the problem. The lowest note on the baritone is not C. It's D. It's one step shy of being low enough to give us that satisfying foundation, that satisfying uh, sort of focal point, it's one step shy of being able to play the root of many of the songs that we're going to be playing. It seems like uh, like a mismatch. And so let me give you an example. Let, let's see if we can if we can play this here. Now, I don't know if you can hear this. Uh, let, let me try again here. Bum, bum, bum. This is uh, by Georges Bizet. It's the Farandole. Uh, it's a pretty famous piece. And let me play it and uh, as an example here of why this is such a vexed question. 
is going to want to play da, 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 dum, bum, bum. it's going to want to play that and yet it can't it's one note short <laughs> da, 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 da. it wants to go down and and be the the root of the chord da, 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 now it gets worse in the next section now listen to what's happening. And all the time, there's this little baritone continuo going down there on the low C. I mean, that whole time, it's sort of underpinned by this low C drone, because that's the key that all the other ukes want to play in. But the baritone doesn't have that note. That's a problem, right? Here, listen to the very end where it's really going for it. chord you better believe that the baritone players are going to want to play that last note and yet it's one note outside of their range oh boy <laughs> you know like i think this might be the reason i haven't released this collection of arrangements because because that one note the low c on the baritone so here are the options. I I have not uh, decided for myself, you know, which option is my favorite. I, I'm very curious to hear from you guys what you favor. What can we do? Well, uh, if you look at a conventional uh, symphony orchestra, you'll sometimes see on the bases um, uh, at the back of the section, they've got an extension, which is actually extends the the string and they can click that extension on with a little flip switch and it actually extends the string and they're able to play notes that are lower than their traditional range okay we could look at something like that that requires you know building something for the baritone to extend that string we could do something similar to that which would be to just tune that one string down that sometimes happens uh, with instruments we call that score to tora it's a fancy word for retuning for a specific song. So instead of playing uh, DGBE tuning, we could play CGBE tuning just for one song if we really needed that low note. You know, it's, it's like drop D tuning on the guitar. Same idea. Okay. Okay. Drop C tuning. That, that might work. It could be a little confusing, but uh, maybe that works. Uh, here are two other more radical options. We could tune the entire rest of the orchestra up one tone. After all, D6 tuning was once a very popular tuning in uh, Europe and also on the East Coast of the United States. It's louder, it's brighter. Uh, it was favored by people like George Formby and Mason Ebreen because they could project more in the days before PA systems. Okay, we could tune everybody up. And that way, everybody would be in the D tuning, and we would have the low D in place 
when we wanted it to be that you know sort of uh, that grounding note that we that we so often need okay that's another option or the final option as i see it is instead of tuning everybody in the band up by one tone we could tune just the baritones down by one tone so instead of dgbe it would be c f Tune the baritone down one tone. It still sounds pretty good. And then you think, oh, wait a minute, I'm going to have to relearn how to read everything. Well, not necessarily. You would just write the parts as if they were playing in standard tuning and let the tuning do the transposition for them. This is extremely common in uh, symphonic and ensemble music. We call it transposing instruments like a saxophone, for example. Uh, you know, you, I think the trumpet is that way as well. You, when, you, when you play what you think is a C, it actually comes out as a different note. Maybe that's the solution. Maybe we treat the baritone as a transposing instrument and uh, then we're able to get that final grounding note that we so often need uh, without upsetting the apple cart too, too much. In any case, there is a bit of a dissonance here in the ukulele world. There's a bit of a fracture that we haven't really uh, come to any consensus around. And uh, as more and more people look for larger ensemble arrangements, specifically for ukulele and specifically for uh, uh, ensembles with multiple sizes of ukulele, including baritone, we are going to encounter this problem. <laughs> I should say it's a challenge. I'm sure we can overcome this, um, but until I hear from you guys, I'm not sure I'm gonna release that collection because it just, uh, I feel like I'm just going out on a limb and, and making it up, you know, like, oh, here's my rule. Let's all, uh, let's all follow the rule. I'd much rather hear from people out there who are interested in this, uh, in this, I understand very fringe, very niche topic within the ukulele world. But when we talk about baritone and we talk about tuning the baritone, we can't help but eventually stumble upon this difficulty in the ukulele world and the way that the standard tuning relates to the baritone tuning. And I'd be very curious to hear your ideas. Um, by all means, email me, admin at jameshillmusic.com uh, or use the form on Utropolis. Um, I'd be very curious to hear your thoughts on this. Thank you for listening. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for taking an interest in the baritone. Baritone is beautiful. I hope if you haven't explored it yet that you will take this as a cue to go and uh, get one, borrow one, um, get your hands on one somehow because it will open doors for you and it will open your ears in a new way. And as I said right at the beginning, it may just be the way to have your cake and eat it too, to um, keep your hands happy and your voice happy. The baritone and the standard tuning ukulele do make a beautiful combination. Um, if one doesn't work for a song, the other probably will. And as much as I've been highlighting some of the subtle challenges that we have, uh, and the decisions that we have to make as a community, the two go together so beautifully. And uh, I hope you'll um, I hope you'll make the most of that. So thanks for tuning in to uh, the Utropolis Live once again. And uh, I'll see you next month. We'll probably do one more before taking a break for the summer. And uh, until then, keep on strumming and take care of yourselves. Bye for now. <laughs>